I'm a park ranger who witnessed something strange. So it's Christmas Eve, and that means holiday cheer. However, for me, that always means work. I work at a national park, so I will not say the name for my privacy. Anyway, I work as a park ranger, and I always work around the holidays. Despite what my co-workers think, I don't mind the holidays. I just like the alone time. Not many park rangers work around the holidays. Sure, it's extra work, but it's always fine. Anyway, I'm telling you about this because of a strange occurrence I experienced yesterday. It was a slow day. Most people were at home celebrating. I got a call on my radio about a missing hiker. It wasn't too far from my location, so I took it. I hopped into my Jeep and drove over there. As I was driving, I noticed a big lump on the path. I got out of my car and walked towards it. It reeked. Unfortunately, I recognized the smell. It was a dead animal. I turned on my flashlight, and it was a deer. Its throat was slashed open, and much worse was done to it. I'm used to seeing dead animals, but what happened to this deer made me want to vomit. I shivered. I grabbed a box from my pocket and pulled out a cigarette and lit it with my lighter. It warmed my body in the frozen air. It's a bad habit I've been trying to break, but I just can never break it. I went back to my car to call it in and drove past it. Then I heard the worst and my tire popped. I went out to check it and it appeared that it was popped by a sharp rock. Unfortunately, I already used my spare tire and forgot to replace it. It appeared I would be walking. The missing hiker was only about a mile away anyway. I looked up to see the clouds pull apart to reveal the full moon. I quickly heard a woman scream. I ran towards the shout. Miss, where are you? I screamed. The scream became more beastly and animalistic. I turned on my flashlight when I stepped on something. Torn clothes and a boot. Women size seven. Then as I was walking, I heard a branch break behind me. I turned around to see animalistic eyes. They looked almost human. I put my flashlight on the pair of eyes. It appeared wolf-like. I dropped my flashlight in fear. My brain screamed to run. My legs began to make me move in the opposite direction from whatever that thing was. I knew whatever it was chasing me. I heard its footsteps behind me. I ran praying that I could get away. I decided to head to my car. But the worst that could happen, happened. I tripped and tumbled down a hill, hitting my head on a rock on the way down. Everything was becoming a blur, and I felt whatever it was bite down on my shoulder. As if instinct, I grabbed my gun. Remembering it was there, I fired off randomly, hoping I hit it. It ran off, making sounds of pain. I knew I couldn't let myself pass out. I felt around my belt and couldn't find my flare. I began crawling around in pain, hoping I'd find it. I felt my arm getting numb. I laid over, facing the sky with my gun clenched in my hand. Hoping it wouldn't come back, everything went black. I woke up shortly after in a ranger jeep. It was the new guy. My arm was poorly tied with a rag. He looked over at me. You got pretty banged up. What the hell attacked you? He asked. A monster, I responded. I don't remember what he said as I zoned out. Eventually we got to the ER and they stitched me up. Today strange things have been happening. When I was trying to sleep, I couldn't get a wink of sleep. I was just so hungry, I went to the fridge and ate the raw steak, eating every bit of it. I keep biting my tongue. It appears as if my teeth have gotten sharper, too. The park said I could take the day off, but I refused. My arm feels better already. It's strange. I'm a bit worried if I'll see that thing again and if it will be my end on Christmas Eve, but I have to figure out what that thing is and make sure it can't hurt anyone. I also know what it's done to me. If anyone has info on the creature, please tell me. live in a rural area in Florida. This happened a few weeks ago. I was driving by myself at around midnight and I came to a stoplight. 
where there's a cemetery on the right and new apartment buildings on the left. This particular light is extremely long since it's not activated by sensors when you pull up to the light. So I'm waiting for a few minutes and all of a sudden I instinctively look behind me. It felt like someone was watching me intently. About 30 feet away from where I was waiting for the light is a bus stop behind me. Right in front of the benches where you wait for the bus, I see a huge figure that looks like a wolf or a giant dog. I'm staring at it, thinking to myself, wow, that's an enormous dog. All the while, I start to feel goosebumps. I feel my heart start racing, and I can't figure out why. I start to feel evil thoughts in my head. I say feel because I couldn't make out what words were being said. I just remember while I was staring at this dog, I felt like it was mocking me, laughing and challenging me. Then I see the figure stand up on two legs while staring in my direction. It stood up and was suddenly taller than the top of the bus overhang, but it didn't look like a human. It looked like an animal just started standing on two legs. Meanwhile, I'm still waiting for the damn light to turn green. And keep in mind, there's lights all around the bus stop, but this figure was pure black. So the figure was stood up on two legs, and now it looked like a huge dog with an alpaca neck and body. But the neck looked really girthy. I see this thing continue to stare in my direction, and I think to myself, okay, this is really weird, but even if it's my imagination, it's gonna disappear when I start driving. The whole time, I'm feeling panicked, and I hear in my head run, but I can chase you. I skirt out of the stoplight. It's still freaking red, but I did not care at that point, and drive away as quick as I can. And then, I look behind me as I'm driving, and the freaking figure is sprinting at full speed on all fours behind me. It looked like a deranged wolf was chasing me. I felt pure panic as I was speeding away, and maybe out of instinct I yelled, I have God with me. You can't hurt me. Nothing can hurt me. I am protected by my angels and by God. Paraphrasing here. It was at that point I realized I was feeling like I was being choked. Because after I said that out loud, I felt like I could breathe. I didn't feel like I was being chased anymore. And when I looked back, the thing was gone. The total time I spent at the light was around three minutes. The light takes like five plus minutes to turn green. And when it stood on two legs, it did look like an animal, but with human-like mannerisms, and the legs were human-like as well. Let me know your thoughts. I'm 60 years old, and except for five years in the 1990s when I lived in northern Idaho, I've lived in northern California all my life. Thanks to my father, I've been hunting, fishing, and camping since I was old enough to walk. I've had quite a few experiences of these Sasquatch beings from whoops that were so close and loud enough that I could feel it in my chest to being escorted out of the woods with that weird walk when you feel like you're being stalked. The nights at my current residence can be a bit of an adventure with strange murmurings and whistles to being woken up from the house being banged on. The experience I want to share is my first. It happened during the summer by a high mountain stream in a meadow while I was with my friend Mike. This was in the Lassen National Park in Northern California. I first discovered this beautiful secluded place several years earlier during a deer hunting trip with my dad. Once you leave the paved road, it's about an hour's drive up a winding dirt road full of switchbacks to where we parked. It was about an hour before sundown. We began gathering firewood and setting up camp. It was about two hours after the sun went down. We had a bite to eat and were sitting around the fire discussing how we wanted to fish the stream in the morning. Then uphill from us, about 50 yards away, came a strange sound. The best description I can give you is a cross between a cough and a bark, only much louder and more guttural, for lack of a better description. I'll just refer to it as a bark. Then it did it again and again. Soon there was barking in groups of five or six, and then it would go silent for a minute or two, then would start up again. I've never heard anything like it before or since. 
I've been all over the Internet trying to find out what it was, and the closest thing I find is some close gorilla sounds and a baboon bark that is close but not exact. We both stood up, and Mike asked, What is that? I was dumbstruck. I didn't know what to tell him. He was new to the outdoors, and I was a so-called experienced outdoorsman. I admitted I was scared. Finally, I whispered, I don't know. I told him to put more wood on the fire and unstrap the Winchester 2535 carbine I had packed. It was a moonless night, so seeing anything beyond the fire was impossible. After about 25 minutes of this damn barking going on, I told Mike I was going to step away from the fire to see if I can spot anything silhouetted against the night sky. I stepped away about 15 yards, sat at my rifle against a tree, and kept my hands around my eyes binocular, like to try and black out the light from the fire. I stared up the hillside every once in a while. I thought I could see starlight being blocked out or a dark shape appearing where it wasn't a little bit before, but nothing conclusive. After a few minutes, I realized Mike was standing next to me with his knife in his hand. I was just about to speak when there came a loud crashing of brush and branches as something was heading down the hill, straight for us. I grabbed my rifle and levered a shell into the chamber when all of a sudden, out of the darkness, came a door. She stepped into the firelight, slowed to a walk, stopped directly between us, and stared at us with huge eyes. She was so close I could almost have reached out and poked her with the barrel of my rifle. My heart was beating out of my chest, and I was almost hyperventilating. I was so relieved when that does stepped into the firelight, not some beast, but I was really confused. Was the doe making those sounds? Then that damn barking started up again, and... This time it sounded even more irritated. The doe's head snaps back, looking over its shoulder. Then she did a quick step past us, heading in the opposite direction from us, and disappeared into the darkness. That doe was less afraid of us and our fire than of whatever was up the hill from us. We both stepped back over to the fire and briefly discussed packing up and heading out, but quickly decided against it, fearing the trail would be impossible to follow in the dark. Then that damn thing started pacing back and forth while barking at us. The barking would get farther away, maybe 100 yards or more, and then it would make its way back directly uphill from us. It seemed like every time it got closer, the barking sounded more irritated. It would get farther away, then back again, farther away, then back again. Our nerves were getting worse and worse with our ever shrinking wood pile when finally after about two hours of the barking it got farther and farther away and then went silent thank god the rest of the night was uneventful needless to say neither of us slept much and every perceived sound sent us both upright and wide awake the next day we packed up early and hit the trail This incident occurred in October 2020 in Pelham and Helena, Alabama. I lived near the border of the two towns and followed the strange occurrence from Pelham into Helena. Although this is a lengthy story, I want to provide as many details as possible, as my interaction with this mysterious entity spanned over an hour and a half, leaving me with a sense of bewilderment. Despite my attempts to rationalize the events, I find myself unable to do so. I hope that by sharing my experience, someone else who may have encountered a similar incident can shed light on this perplexing situation. The night began like any other. My girlfriend and I were at home in Pelham, Alabama, engaging in our usual activities of playing video games and relaxing. It was around 1 a.m. when I decided to step outside for a cigarette. However, my ordinary night took an unexpected turn when I heard a woman's voice yelling, Someone help me! Initially dismissing it, thinking it might be a trivial occurrence in our residential development, I became increasingly concerned as the desperate cries persisted for over five minutes. The source of the yelling seemed to be emanating from a small patch of woods across the main road near my development. Initially attributing it to a fox, I thought nothing more of it. However, the continuous pleas for help, now more distinct and coherent, raised my apprehension. 
Intrigued, I cautiously approached the area, only to find the screams moving away from me, leading to another development across the street. Entering the new development, I was relieved to discover that the source of the disturbance might be a TV or Halloween decoration. However, my confusion intensified as the cries seemed to be elusive, moving further away. Attempting to follow the sound, I walked down the road, but it became increasingly challenging to pinpoint its origin. Eventually, I decided to return home, questioning why someone in distress would be moving so swiftly. To my surprise, the cries resumed with greater intensity, now leading me to a larger forest near a cell phone tower. Standing on the street, I heard the screams about 50 yards from me within the woods, and I noticed an unusual pattern. The entity, whatever it was, moved parallel to me, screaming for help, running to the right, then the left, in a seemingly impossible manner. This continued for five minutes, with the entity only stopping to speak before resuming its erratic movements. Things took a terrifying turn when the entity changed its cries to why aren't you helping me and started emitting low, grunting, growling noises, overwhelmed by fear. I realized the urgency of the situation. The entity seemed to be coaxing me into the woods, refusing to leave but desperately wanting me to enter. The grunting intensified and its movements became faster and more aggressive, running back and forth just ten yards away. As the entity's actions became increasingly menacing, I thought I saw something low to the ground, possibly white, moving rapidly. Fearing for my safety, I attempted to reach for the camera button on my phone but was too shaken. The grunting only intensified and I decided to call 911 immediately, convinced that whatever this thing was, it wasn't friendly and posed a threat. As soon as the Helena police arrived, the entity ceased its actions. Although this narrative may be lengthy, I share it with the hope that someone else who has experienced a similar incident may come forward. My girlfriend and I initially tried to rationalize it as a child playing with a boombox, creating scary noises. However, I know deep down that this explanation does not align with the chilling reality of that night. If anyone has encountered a similar situation, please reach out as understanding this mysterious occurrence remains crucial for both of us. The bad place. That's what the locals in my small town call the woods that circle our little slice of paradise. There are many different rumors that the residents murmur about to each other, but I don't think anybody really knows what waits in those woods. Devil cults, child-eating witches, creatures from beyond, and even aliens are some of the theories that float about. They're all bullshit, if you ask me. But what isn't bullshit is those woods have definitely earned their nickname, the bad place. Hikers have entered and have never come out. Kids have dared each other to enter and vanished. Dogs and cats have run off into the woods just to never be seen again. If you stick to town, you're safe. The only rule is don't go too deep into the bad place or you'll just become another statistic. I live in a small house just on the outskirts of town. There's an entry to the bad place about a hundred feet from my front doorstep. At night, I keep my door locked and shotgun by my side ready to fire at anything that comes from those woods. Nothing ever has except for sounds, horrible sounds. The sounds of children screaming and crying out for help. I think it's the trees. Once the woods have you, they become you and can even communicate with you. That's just speculation, but it's the only thing that makes sense. Their cries nearly tricked me the first time I heard them. I've told the local sheriff and his deputy, but it always falls on deaf ears. They're just as terrified as the rest of us. Who can blame them? Bowl, my six-year-old chocolate lab, sleeps in my room every night. He whimpers when the wind blows at night. I'll never forget my journey into the bad place. The night Bull got out and chased after a monstrous buck into the woods. This wasn't a regular-looking buck either. 
He had red, beady eyes with torn-up flesh hanging from his body and crooked antlers that were broken in half and dangled loosely. I grabbed my shotgun flashlight and started towards the bad place. I moved as quickly as I could. It still surprises me today that I wasn't more reluctant at the time. The wind became cold as I progressed deeper into the woods. The trees grew closer together and the woods began to swallow me. A sinking feeling filled the pit of my stomach. My heart pounded in my chest like a drum. I was terrified, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't call out Bo's name. My throat tightened more and more every time I tried. I managed to cry out to the woods, and they answered me. The dense trees suddenly started to open and spread apart from one another like a crowd allowing someone to pass. The wind quickly ceased. It was quiet. The woods had become eerily still. There was no signs of Bo anywhere. I looked in every direction. And then, a whimper. I followed the whimpering to a pile of tree limbs. Bo was lying near it. A strong gust of wind blew, knocking me to the ground. I gasped as I landed on my back. The wind entered me and filled me. Bo and I ran back to our little cabin. I never spoke a word about going into the woods because I fear how people would react. For the first few months, things were normal. And then it all started. The nightmares, the visions, and the transformation. My nightmares started to become extremely vivid. They varied in context, but all had a similar ending. It always ended with the woods taking me back. I can still hear the woods calling me back. The trees whisper my name and the wind blows for me. The bad place is in complete control now. I can feel it in my heart. I know it in my mind. There's something growing inside of me. I can feel it moving in my stomach. The pain is shooting to the rest of my body. My skin has started to dry up and become a wood, like texture, flaking off in good-sized pieces. Maybe I should go back. Maybe I should give it what it wants. Me. Okay, so this is back when I was in grade one, so I was probably around six. I'm 19 now. I lived in a ratty old trailer park in a small town, and this one trailer had a lot of bad stuff happen. While I was in there, which I blame on whatever the hell was in there before us, I really don't know where to start. I'm no writer, but I just want to get this out. So I don't have many memories from this place, mostly just pictures, but they're all bad very very bad my parents were both heavy alcoholics they kept each other going my mother was working at some place where they sell or rent rvs and my dad was one of those mechanics who would work for whoever paid him so they had money to drink pretty much every day i knew once one of them walked in with a few cases of beer it was time to disappear anyways i'm rambling the point is once people drank in that trailer they'd transform anger screaming, every form of abuse. One night I'm laying in bed asleep facing the wall and I feel a hard slap right on my back. From what I remember, I turned around terrified and looked under the bed, then ran to my parents' room and told them what happened. But my mom says she's never ever heard a child scream like I did. They ran in my room and turned on the light and I was freaking right out. From what she made out from my blubbering was that something hit me. They lift up my shirt, and what else did they see? But a huge red handprint right on my back. They moved me to their room, and I slept with them until I was about ten. Never ever. Slept facing the wall until I was about seventeen. It's funny, too, because my mom says she was talking to my auntie on the couch there before or after this event, and my auntie was facing the hallway. Mom's back to the hall. She says my auntie looked toward the hall while they were talking, and her face turned white. My mom turned around, didn't see nothing, and asked Annie what she seen. My auntie had to calm down a bit before she told my mom. She had seen what? Looked like a little old lady around four foot in some kind of sheet or cloak over it, walked from my parents' room towards my room. But there was a tail dragging out from behind it. They were dead sober this day. 
In this house, I've gotten asthma and sent to the hospital with a combo of chickenpox and pneumonia went deaf. This house was just awful. Moved out with my mom when I was maybe eight. Happened to drive past there one day to see it getting demolished. I'm just wondering what happened there before we moved in, or why or how that thing ended up in there. That place was old. Just happy that thing didn't follow us. It's a strange national park, the one I work at. No problems with the ecosystem whatsoever. No invasive species, no declining populations, and most surprising of all, no poachers. A neighboring park just a hundred kilometers from ours is infested with salvinia, water hyacinth, and has a very low elephant population because of poachers. It hasn't always been like this, though, at least that's what I'm told. The head's been working here for 30 years. He says in the 90s, the rivers were so choked with salvinia that almost 10% out of all the hippos at the park died from dehydration. There were so many poachers that the white rhino was practically non-existent in the park. The government at the time was extremely poor, so it couldn't help much. Then suddenly in 2002, all the problems just vanished into thin air. No more invasive plants. When the rangers at the time checked on the river, they found all the salvinia dead and decaying. The white rhino population magically rebounded, when just a year ago, there were less than 200 of them. It was pretty surprising, but I mean no one was complaining. Everything has a cost, though, and this was no exception. There were sightings of things, the carcass of a lion, completely drained of blood. Trees with faces murmuring in an incomprehensible tongue. Impossibly huge creatures not resembling any animal in the area. This is a collection of all my experiences with these anomalies. June 16, 2008 Jameson! Jameson! A mayor yelled. Coming! What's got you shouting? I asked. I found a carcass, he said, looking visibly pale. That's nothing to be yelling about, I thought. Probably just the work of a lion or some wild dogs. It's an elephant. It's B. You should just look for yourself. Okay, an elephant carcass certainly is unusual, but I doubt it warrants yelling. With that, he took me to the carcass, leading me further up the lake. A minute later, we arrived at the location. All right, I can see why he was unsettled if... Elephants are killed, which itself is very rare. It's usually by lions, and then... Only by the lions slowly wearing them out with consecutive weak attacks until they can no longer walk and die from blood loss. This was nothing like that. The elephant's lower half was missing. It looked like it was bitten clean in half, the organs and viscera flowing out. The shape of the teeth didn't match anything that lived here. This was my first time encountering one of the anomalies. I don't know what to do. I've never seen anything like this before. How was I supposed to protect the other animals from this monster? Most of all, I was scared for my life. I radioed my boss and told the mayor to gather the other two and stay inside the cabin and not to come out for anything. I stood out on the porch nervously glancing at the trees, jumping at any sound I heard. Yes, Jameson? Anything the matter? She asked. Yes, ma'am, it's just that there's a carcass and elephants bitten clean in half, I said. Gather everyone in the cabin and do not come out until I'm there, she said urgently. Yes, I already did that. Good, now wait for me. We huddled in the cabin, glancing out of the windows every few seconds. Hey, Jameson, this isn't real, right? You're playing a prank, aren't you? Sid said skeptically. I'm afraid not, Sid. This is very real. Poor kid, he just joined three months ago. I remembered my first three months at the park. I could barely deal with lions and crocs. This kid had to deal with a monster that bit elephants in half. I saw something, Amara yelled. Probably just a will be scared away by your yelling a mare, I said. No way this thing made the top branches of the tree rustle. 
too big for a wildebeest. All right, now I was spooked. I took a look out of the window and swore I saw a large, thin shadow dart out of my sight. But maybe I was just imagining things. I had just seen something surreal, after all. People tend to see things after an experience like that, but something deep inside me told me not to go anywhere near the tree line. Get away from the windows. Close those curtains. Keep your rifles close, I yelled. Doesn't matter if it was real or not. I want us to stay safe. I was right, wasn't I? Why would you do this otherwise? Amari said wide-eyed. Maybe I wouldn't risk the guys getting nervous and making a fatal mistake. An hour passed with us, just huddled together, hands on our rifles, just waiting for it to tear through the cabin. A sharp, shrill sound rang through the air. I almost shot the door, but it was just the doorbell. Looking through the peephole, I saw it was the boss. I let her in. As soon as she entered, I saw the team reflexive relaxing. They trusted her a lot. She was the one with the most experience, the most dependable. She'd brought her shotgun with her. That meant business. Show me the carcass. I looked at the tree line, expecting something to move, but nothing happened. Seems like whatever was there before was gone now. I led the boss to the side of the carcass. Oh, this looks horrendous. We need to deal with thing before it bites anything else in half. No surprise at all. Typical of her. Shouldn't we leave quickly? Animals don't usually abandon their carcasses for long, right? Sid said, glancing around nervously. That's right, kiddo, but this isn't a normal animal by any means, is it? Yes, but... Don't worry, I'll just check the carcass for any clues, and we'll be gone in five minutes. He stayed silent after that. I noticed he had his arm on his rifle. The boss bent down and stuck her hand into the carcass. I resisted the urge to puke. A bit of digging around later, she pulled out a completely intact tooth. It was gigantic, almost as large as a banana, and there were serrations on the outer edge. Dealing with these anomalies for six years teaches you where to look, eh? Nobody said anything. With a tooth that big, the beast had to be at least twice the size of a giraffe, if not larger. The next few days went by in a flash. We would find new corpses by the river each day, rhino, hippo, boar. The thing never ate the carcasses, only bit it in half and run away to God knows where, before the sun came up. We won't get anywhere like this. We need to stay the night, said the boss. I couldn't help but agree, but it was too dangerous. What was the guarantee that the thing wouldn't decide to take a few more victims for the night? True, it's dangerous, but there aren't any other options. We can either stay the night or let this thing roam the park freely. Acknowledging this, only Jameson and I will stay the night. You two stay in the cabin. We'll radio you if there's any problems. That night, we got our equipment and situated ourselves about 100 meters away from where we found the carcasses every night, behind some foliage. We had night vision goggles on. Didn't want to risk alerting whatever this thing was of our presence. Whatever this thing was, it was smart. It's the middle of winter and water is scarce. Animals have to come to the water holes to drink or die of thirst. Predators exploited this by wading near the water holes and picking off easy prey. The first few hours went by fairly quickly. Nothing of interest happened. Hippos grazed along the banks of the river. Herds of elephants came and went. There weren't any predators in sight. That was good for us, but it also meant that something was wrong. This was the largest lake in the park. There were always predators here. Their absence means that something scared them away, something larger, stronger. Four hours into the search, I heard a hippo baying. You hear that? I asked the boss. Yep, it's coming from the general direction of the corpses. Must be that thing she said, pointing to the spot. I turned my goggles to where she was pointing. A large male was baying wildly into the darkness. I couldn't see anything. I turned my goggles in the general direction of the hippo's baying, but there wasn't anything there. The hippo just continued frantically baying before suddenly turning around and running at top speed in the opposite direction. 
thunderous footsteps ran behind it. I strained my eyes, but I couldn't see anything. There was simply nothing behind it, but a hippo wouldn't just run from nothing, would it? And the footsteps were very real. Come on, we gotta go, the boss yelled. Are you out of your mind? I yelled back. But it was too late. She was already running after the hippopotamus. Swearing, I got up and started running too. The footstep became faster and faster until they suddenly stopped. The hippo's screaming was louder than ever and it felt like it was coming from somewhere above us. A loud crunch. Dead silence. We returned the next morning to half a hippo. Hey, there's something in the ground here, Amari said, pointing to a dinner plate-sized circle in the ground. There were several more a bit forward, almost like the footsteps of a sprinting animal. The length of each step seemed gigantic, almost four meters apart from each other. The footsteps were in the exact direction the hippo ran last night. Seems like last night wasn't a complete waste, said the boss following the tracks. The tracks led all the way to the tree line, where they disappeared under the dense vegetation. It kills its prey, then runs back into the tree line to hide during the light. This thing is creepy, Sid said while stepping a ways away from the tree line. We didn't see it in our goggles last night, so you think this thing is invisible? I asked. Probably not. A lot of these anomalies can't actually be caught on camera, but then again it could be invisible, she said. Why can't they be caught on camera? Easy way to explain why no one outside the park knows about the anomalies, authors these days, so lazy. What the? Well, we've got to kill this thing. How do we even know it can die? I asked. We don't. Just have to take the chance. There was a cold breeze blowing into the woods. I was squatting behind a large bush. About twenty meters to my right was the boss with a rifle trained on the tree line. Sid and Amar were on either side of the wood, ready to shoot if anything went wrong. It gets dark here at 5 p.m., so we had to get into position by 4. Last night the thing attacked at Threme. No reason to believe it wouldn't attack earlier today. It started raining heavily at 8, just perfect. The hippo started running, again from nothing. I wouldn't risk pointing my flashlight at the thing. The thunderous footsteps became faster and faster until they stopped. A loud crunch. All four of us shot together, pointing our flashlights at the sound. Thin black rods, seven meters tall at the shortest. Then they moved, a short jerking motion as if they moved a body they weren't made for. I tried pointing my flashlight at the thing's face, but the light didn't even reach its body, much less its face. All we could see were its legs. Thud, something hit the ground, half a hippo. It took a step forward, but then seemed to think otherwise, turning around and running into the trees. We didn't see any half-eaten carcasses after that, but we occasionally see circular markings in the ground. Part 2. This was one of the more horrifying experiences I've had with these anomalies. It's one of those things that sends a chill down your spine. Makes you look over your shoulder just to make sure there's nothing following you. May 3rd, 2009. If you look to your left, you'll see a herd of wildebeest stopping to take a drink from that watering hole. In a river that big, there's bound to be some crocs. If we're lucky, we'll get to see one on the hunt. Almost as soon as I had finished saying that a croc lunged from the surface of the water, catching a wildebeest right in the face, drawing gasps and shrieks from the crowd. It then started turning its body in a circle. Aptly named the Death Roll, this move tore the victim into bite-sized chunks that the crocodile could then easily consume. This riled up the crowd even more. What do you say we take a break? The boss said, addressing the customers. Is that safe? Aren't there a bunch of predators here? Asked a concerned father holding his four-year-old. I could understand why he was concerned, but in general it's best not to bring a four-year-old to a safari. Don't worry, we've chosen a location that predators seldom visit, and even if they do show up, we have these, 
she said, patting her rifle. That seemed to calm him down. It was a quick 15-minute break. Stretch our legs and get back in the Jeep. It's dangerous to stay out of a vehicle for too long. The rest of the safari went pretty smoothly. We saw a pride of lions, a couple of giraffes, and even a honey badger. During the drive back to the exit, the parents of that four-year-old seemed a bit anxious. It was about an hour until dark, and we had reached the exit. We bid all the customers farewell and started getting in our cars to drive back to our cabins. The parents of the child came up to us and asked us to wait. The child was nowhere in sight. So, our child wasn't on the bus after breaking. He was cut off by the bosses yelling. Your child wasn't on the bus. You choose to tell this to us now. What the hell? How the hell did they not notice that till now? What the hell kind of parents were they? Yes, we know, but she usually disappears. We thought she was just somewhere on the bus, the mother said, looking guilty. The boss sighed, looking disappointed and exasperated. Jameson, gather up Sid and Amar. We have to go search for this kid. What's her name? Ah, uh, Amy. I told both of them to stay right here in the guard booth until we came back and not to go out for anything. I didn't really have high hopes for this child. Night is when the predators come out and it was almost dark. Nevertheless, I got in my jeep and we drove to the place we got off for a break. It was pretty far from the exit by the time we got there. It was so dark we couldn't see two feet in front of us. This ruled out any possibility of looking for her tracks. We'll split up. Each one of us will go in one direction. Grab a flashlight and make sure you do not yell out for her. That'll just attract the attention of predators or worse things. I went right, into the woods. The boss backtracked. Sid went west and Amari went north, in the direction of the river. My last encounter with that giant thing shook me up pretty bad, so I felt very uncomfortable going into the woods, if not scared. At the very least, there aren't many predators in the woods. It's been almost half an hour of me stumbling through the woods. The clouds covered the moon, so it made the already dark night even darker. Without my flashlight, I wouldn't have been able to see my own hand held in front of me. All the while, I had this strange feeling that something was watching me. I did have mild paranoia, but this was different. It felt like it was coming from somewhere far away, like someone was looking at me through the scope of a sniper rifle, and I didn't have any means to protect myself from the inevitable shot. I slowly started moving to the edges of the wood. It made no sense for me to come here. Why would a scared kid go into this dark and creepy place? I would have stayed clear of this place during the night when I was her age, Soon after I saw the place where the trees ended, it was still a way away, but I was hit with a wave of relief when I saw it. Then I heard it, a soft whispering from the center of the wood. No, not whispering, a melody. It sounded marvelous. It sounded like home. I needed to go there. I had to. It would solve all my problems, fix all my mistakes. It's heaven, I'm sure of it. I began blindly running through the wood. All I knew was that I needed to make it to the center. Branches smashed against face, twigs clawing at my cheeks, but I didn't care. I just kept running to the center. My thighs burned. If I wasn't motivated by this otherworldly singing, I'm sure I would have dropped to the ground right there from exhaustion. Finally, I crashed through the last row of trees. What awaited me on the other side was no heaven. In fact, it was quite the opposite gigantic. It was all I could think of looking at the massive being that faced me, three times as tall as the other trees, its giant face etched into the bark, smiling, laughing at my idiocy for being drawn here. The ground erupted into fragments, revealing gigantic roots. They tried grabbing me, but I was faster. I ran straight for its face. Laughing, it opened its mouth wider, as if taunting me to get inside, since I was as good as dead anyways. I ignored it and ran farther to the left where it couldn't see me. I grabbed its bark and started to climb. At the very least, it would take longer to catch me up here, long enough that I could call for help. 
I was a third of the way there and well out of the root's reach. Thud, something massive hit me on the back, knocking the wind out of me. I lost my grip and fell. I was thirty feet up. I'd die. The ground was rushing to meet me in less than a second, but just when it looked like I was going to die, a huge root spurted from the ground and grabbed me. It had saved me. I looked at its face, expecting to see a genuine smile or compassion. Evil, pure evil. Oh, it was smiling all right, a smile you would see on a sociopathic murderer's face. Opening its mouth wide, it pulled me inside with exaggerated slowness, as if to taunt me. Slowly, I was being pulled further and further inside. The smell was horrendous, rotting vegetation and flesh mixed with the smell of blood and sap. Its teeth were concentric circles. I imagined myself being turned to mush in this being's mouth. The sun was rising. It was beautiful. The fact that this was probably the last sunrise I would see was very much on my mind. They were growing slower, the movements of its branches. It was taunting me even more, so I thought. Surprisingly, it grinded to a halt like a chainsaw running out of fuel. Its eyes stared into space like it didn't see me. The branches coiled around me, unfurled, sending me face first into the ground. Its mouth remained open, though. The boss said she didn't know about the giant man, eating tree when she sent into the woods. I don't really care, though. I'm just happy to be alive. For context, yes, I believe in the paranormal. I've had encounters and experiences, as has my mom and grandma. This was a little different and not scary, just strange. I was a manager of a very well-known drugstore and took a back road to the store, back and forth every day for two years. It was semi-rural, as it had once been acres of farmland that was now being sold off to developers, just for some insight into the area. My ex-in-laws lived in this area for 30 years, on 200 acres, and had a cattle farm. They still lived nearby, just on a smaller farm. So this was a very frequented area to drive for my family, and my ex knew the area very. Well, this was a heavily mined area where a lot of strange things happened. There was also a huge landfill in the area. I was coming home one day, July-ish, not too tired, and was looking across the cornfields, and as I came around a bend, noticed a house on the edge of the fields I had never noticed before. It was a very unassuming red house, small with a peak roof and a porch in front. My first thought was not, wow, I've never seen that house before, but how in the heck do the people get into it? There are no driveways leading to it. Weird, this is 2015, and there has to be a driveway. As I continued and rounded another bend, I couldn't see the house anymore, but was looking at a few houses nearby to see if their driveways went back to this house and couldn't see any way into it. By then, there is a very well-traveled intersection and a huge church, so I just sort of kept alert and driving. Later in the evening, I'm telling my ex about this house and that it felt very weird in all the time I had driven that road and never noticed it. Went to work the next day coming home. The only way I would have seen it, it wasn't there. I don't know what I saw that day, but I can still see that house very clearly in my head. Okay, first you must know that 30 years ago from age 17. 22, I did a lot of crystal meth. I know what you're thinking, but it wasn't like that. I was extremely high-functioning. I graduated from college magna cum laude with a double major in Russian and religion and held down a complicated job. I was the youngest person at my university ever inducted into Phi Beta Kappa, which people tell me is really something. I was asked to represent my university by speaking at academic conferences. I didn't do meth to cope with how busy I was. I did all of the above because I had so much extra time thanks to the meth and decided to fill it by learning the Russian language. All of it. 
in one night. I lived a very schizophrenic existence. No one would have believed by looking at me that I was a pretty hardcore meth user and mainly hung out with strippers and bikers who were much older than I. Here's what I looked like back then, when I took a break from doing meth to hang out at a coup. Back in Gainesville, I had a group of associates, drug addicts often don't have friends, whose favorite thing to do was get really high and go out to paint his prairie. P.P. at midnight. P.P. is a unique natural feature in north-central Florida. It's a vast grassland ringed by dense, spooky live oak hammocks and marshy areas, and also a few residential houses that run some cattle. It's very big, very wild, and mostly untrailed. We'd go out there at midnight and take off all of our clothes, including our shoes. We'd split up and spend the rest of the night walking alone and totally naked in the darkness. We were definitely high as F, but we weren't dangerous. We were weirdos and artists, members of punk bands, and also, sometimes, River Phoenix. This was in the late 80s and early 90s, so there were no cell phones, and we never ever brought flashlights. Your eyes would adjust to the moonlight very quickly, and the few trails out there were made of fine white sand, which gleamed even when the moon was new. Once you got off the trail, though, you were on your own, and many dangerous things bit us while we were out there. One night I was halfway down the main trail, away from the parking area, when I heard voices. Lots of voices. It was 2 a.m., and I was alone and naked. The moon was totally full, and the trail I was on seemed to radiate its own silver light. The voices belonged to young men and women, and they were laughing and shouting and saying, Dude, and you, Heather, that's so gross. They sounded like drunk frat boys and sorority girls from the university. I wasn't afraid of them, but I didn't want to waste time answering the questions they'd undoubtedly have if they saw me. In the moonlight, it was easy to spot a sawpaw meadow about 25 feet off the trail. I ran over to it and squatted behind it, wrapping my hair around my arms and chest. The group of about ten kids neared. They were still hooting and bickering. Soon they'd pass by. They were even with me and still making loud sounds. If I were a cryptid, I could attack and eat two of them before they realized anything was wrong. They passed by, and their voices grew fainter. Finally, it was silent. I counted slowly to ninety, not rushing through any Mississippis, and stood up. The ten frat and sorority kids were standing directly across from me on the trail, staring at me, speechless, with identical looks of terror on their conventionally attractive faces. I was five foot eight, weighed about one hundred fifteen pounds, and was totally naked. My pale skin, given to me by my Scottish grandmother, glowed like a corpse's in the moonlight. My waist-length auburn hair was wavy and unruly on a good day, but on this night, thanks to the humidity and the meth, it was a sentient thing all its own, standing out in a mass around my face and shoulders, writhing and beckoning. I decided to go with what my observers were probably thinking, which was ghost or witch or demon. It was close enough. I stood perfectly still and stared back at them, my face expressionless. They let out a collective yawp of horror and hightailed it back toward the parking area. I turned my back on the palmetto and lit off through the woods, avoiding the trails for the rest of the night. When the sky began to pinken, the six of us met by the place where we stashed our clothes. As we were all dressing, the talk was mainly about the screaming. My associates could hear it clear across the prairie, over by the swamp. Weird night, they said. Hope it's nothing to worry about. For context, a a female 17 have lived in my house my whole life with my two other siblings and parents. My family and I have lived in this partly rural part of the Fenton Heartland, Michigan area for a long while. We own 10 acres of land, which includes a pretty large track in our backyard to ride four-wheelers and such. 
Every once in a great while, it seems, we hear strange and unnerving noises when we go outside. A few years ago, my family took a walk to look at our new neighbor's house, as they were gone for the weekend and said we were welcome to check things out. On our way down our quarter-mile gravel driveway, all of us heard what I can only describe as drums and chanting. It really freaked my brother and I out, because it seemed to be a fair distance away, almost as if it had been coming from the woods in our backyard. There was a fair number of drumming sounds, and then we heard chanting. It must have been pretty far away, but the sound still carried, which made it even creepier. I've probably had this occur two to three times the whole time we've lived here, and every time it has been unsettling and felt really wrong. We would be very aware if our town had any native tribes or reservations around here, but my small conservative hometown would not be the place to do so. I have searched high and low, but haven't been able to find anything on the Internet in close areas with a similar experience. If anyone here has any information, please feel free to share. This happened in the year 2001. I was 19 years old and living with my mom and two aunts in Miami, Florida. On this particular evening, I felt like staying home and reading a book, but my mom came up with the idea to go to the beach. I said no, but she insisted a lot. I even told her we didn't have clean towels to take, and she said no problem. We'll just take a sheet. It's only for a short time. So my mom, two aunts, and I got in the car, and on the way to Miami Beach, we stopped at a gas station. While they were filling the tank, this uneasy feeling came over me, and I felt like getting out of the car and walking home. But I thought there was no reason to feel like this. It was only a trip to the beach. When we got to the beach, it was around 7 p.m., and we were the only people there. I put the sheet on the sand with our stuff, and since only one of my aunts knows how to swim, the four of us stayed close together by the shore. While we stood there with the water barely reaching our waists, this man appeared out of nowhere, black hair, dark kind of dark olive skin, and wearing black shorts. He didn't wear any kind of jewelry or a chain. Besides feeling uncomfortable, immediately my first thought was that he must have walked a lot because I couldn't see his car anywhere. Then I took a look at his face and his eyes were totally black. I could not see the white part. I remember I thought, what the hell is wrong with his eyes? Then he said in a very angry tone, don't any of you know how to swim? Go into the water. He kept his distance. But after he said that, when I looked at him again, I didn't feel I was looking at a man. It was the same feeling you get when you visit the zoo and see a wolf or predator close. Two of my aunts just turned around and avoided looking at him. We stayed right where we were without moving, and my mom put her arms around me and one of my aunts. I felt that he wanted us to go into the water for us to have an accident or something bad. After that, I saw him go into the water very quickly and come out. I only turned around probably less than a minute and he was gone. Now from the place I was, I could see a long distance all over the beach, but he was nowhere to be seen. Since the man talked to us, we were silent, but at that moment one of my aunts told me he disappeared right. I said yes and picked up our stuff as quickly as I could, got into the car and we left. We were very tense and my aunt told me what the hell was that guy. I said I don't know, but it was bad. We were going obviously fast on the highway when all of a sudden I saw a tow truck stopped in front of us without any signs or lights, and my aunt started to brake very slowly. She had an old car. I could see that truck closer and closer till we finally stopped right before hitting it. Thankfully, after that, we made it home safely. But when we got home, I told my mother I didn't feel like going to the beach. But you insisted so much that I went. Something very bad could have happened today. I had an up-close sighting with a Bigfoot in the Cascade Mountain Range near Lincoln City, Oregon, on a short evening hike in the woods with my father. 
We first noticed a terrible stench, and then we saw two glowing red eyes peek out from the side of a massive tree. Keep in mind this is during the evening before the sun goes too far down. This glow was not a reflection. It was a penetrating stare coming from this creature. It was nearly ten feet tall with dark, almost black hair except gray under its chin that went partially down its utterly massive chest. There may have been gray in his hand. It's hard to remember. My father always carried a firearm, whether hunting or not. I never saw him without it. The man was six foot six and built and wasn't scared of anything till we locked eyes with this being. It was peeking up from the trees about 30 yards in front of us. That stopped us both dead in our tracks. We were dead silent as we heard huge footfalls and tree snaps on both sides of us. But Father laid down his caliber 357 right then and there. He apologized to the beings and said he meant them no disrespect. Then he asked permission to leave safe and unharmed. We started to slowly back out of the oddly silent forest. We were careful to go back the way we went in. It seemed my father knew more than he wanted to admit to. Shortly after we got out of the immediate area, we saw three yellow orbs of light where the beings were seen. The stench immediately went away when all three quickly moved deeper into the woods without making a sound, zipping through the trees. As we watched the lights quickly dissipate, we could hear the forest sounds again, and our fear then subsided. This was hard for me to wrap my young mind around. My father insisted we keep the story between us due to the stigma. We got back to the truck and hauled out of there. I lost touch with him soon after this. Hence, I never got to pick his brain for what knowledge he possessed about these beings. So first of all, my friend had recently bought a new house on Black Mountain, so me and some other friends had decided to visit. By the way, for those who don't know, Black Mountain was one of the towns in the Blue Ridge Mountains, just like any other city up in the peaks. The house, though, was near the top of the mountain, in the middle of a forest. We were to stay there for a week, and everything seemed normal at first. Zack, the guy who bought the house, was going out to the town. So it was just me and two other of my buds. But the, the clicking happened. We were just watching some TV on our Samsung, but we interrupted by some strange clicking noises. At first we didn't mind, but it got louder and louder. I stepped outside through the screen door, only to find a strange-looking buck outside the porch. It looked like its mouth were melded together by skin, and it had an abnormal black spot on its back. I'd heard of mutated animals, so I wasn't bothered too much. I went back inside, and three minutes later I heard the clicking again. My two friends were sleeping, so went back into the bedroom, only to find the buck sticking its head out my open window. I closed it slowly and backed away. A few hours later, Zack came back with some pizza, and we all dined in the kitchen. I was ready to sleep early, so I went in the bedroom. About 30 minutes later, I heard yelp and went into the kitchen. My friends had backed away from the window, and we saw the buck outside the window. It began to smell like rotting from outside, so we were pretty startled. We tried to ignore it, and we went back to watching TV. Zack just remembered he had forgot his phone in the car, so I had to retrieve it. Moments later, I heard scream in the distance, so I ran back indoors. The next morning... After a good sleep, we still hadn't forgotten about the buck. Then, when I went to go to the porch, I saw an old man. One of his eyes looked burnt, and I backed away. He was on our property, so I tried to tell him to back away. He only stood there watching me. I ran back to the house, and I didn't see him again. A few days later, nothing strange happened except for the occasional clicking. But we drove back unharmed. Not physically, at least. I did some research and found out about skinwalkers, so I came to this sub to ask for what happened. Would anyone know? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.